Awesome. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Great to see everybody this morning. Uh, I want to take you back uh, 43 years tomorrow. So it was 43 years ago tomorrow that I had uh, purchased a ring, had it in my pocket, was not a half carat ring, was not a quarter carat ring, was not an eighth carat ring, it was not a tenth carat ring. It was called a speck diamond. That's what it's called. I had this, had this ring and I went to Dwajak Hospital, Lee Memorial Hospital. Um, that's where Lori was working. I was, uh, I was 17 years old and I went down into the cafeteria. I want you to imagine this cafeteria. You ever been to those cafeterias where the tables, they pop up like this and you store them away and then you can bring them out? That's where th those tables all over the room, white walls, it was a rough looking place. And uh, Lori had a break, so during her break, she comes down, and uh, I get down one knee, and I ask her to marry me. Now, we are talking about the marvel of marriage. And the first thing I want you to know is how it begins is not how you create the marvel of marriage. But I do believe that Lori and I have discovered a lot about the marvel of marriage, that marriage is an incredible, amazing something that God has created, and I want you to understand those principles. I want you to be able to interact with God's Word. I want you to interact with God about how does, how does that happen? How do you experience the marvel of marriage? And so you may be thinking marvel of marriage. Uh, matter of fact, somebody saw the post and they're like, I don't think people understand that. Like, what is that? Is that even possible? Uh, you may be thinking it's along these lines, a couple of verses. Number one, better to live in the corner of the roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife. You may be thinking, like, okay, we're going to go both ways, not just wife. We're going to go back the other way, right? You may be thinking, a sluggard buries his hand in the dish, and he is too lazy to bring it back to his mouth. You're like, what does that mean? It means you're so lazy you can reach for the food, but you can't get it back. And so... You may have called your husband lazy and many times in the past. Here's a great verse, right? You want to pull this one out? This is, this, this is very descriptive. This one can go both ways. The next two can go both ways. An angry person stirs up conflict. And a hot-tempered person commits many, many, many sins. You got a hot temper, creates all kinds of trouble in your marriage. And this one as well can go both ways. It's addressed to a woman, but can go both ways. The wise woman builds her house, but with her own hands, the foolish one tears her down. Pretty good chance you've experienced that. Man, the wise man builds his house, but with his own hands, the foolish one tears it down. This is what we're trying to build. This is what we're trying to build. You wipe it out along the way. So uh, you may have seen a number of times they'll do these interviews of uh, people who have been married for a very, very long time. They're like 95 years old, and they say, hey, listen, what's the secret of marriage? Invariably, one of them will say compromise. It's compromise. You've got to learn to compromise. So the idea of compromising is that you give a little bit, they give a little bit, they give a little bit, you, you, back and forth. Like we just, we understand each other. We come to do these compromises. Uh, that is totally false. Like, even though they may have thought that was it, that's not it. That's, that is not it. This is what happens when you build your life or your marriage on compromise. You get a calculator. And in this calculator, you have the ability to automatically, women are much better at keeping score than men, but they're automatically, right? Then this calculator, it goes, okay, I gave 54.6%. They owe me. I gave 82.3%. They owe me. I gave percent. They owe me. Now, here's the magic of this calculator. When they do something for you, it doesn't record it. It doesn't record it. You only remember what you've done for them. It creates competition. It creates competition. It creates this relationship whereby you're constantly thinking, I have done so much. I have given so much. I have done so much. I've given so much. And you are literally trying to win this has never dawned on you before. But when you win, that means there's a loser. So your whole strategy of marriage is to create a loser who you're married to. 
competition is horrendous in a marriage. So I'd like to uh, um, take a few minutes and introduce you to the idea of oneness. And to do that, I've asked my beautiful wife to come and join me. It, it helps in marriage if you have servants who bring you out chairs <laughs> wherever you go. That's awesome. <laughs> you don't have to touch it. The magic men upstairs, they take care of it. Nope. Nope. You can always trust those guys. Okay. Uh, so first question, what do you love about being one? I can't remember what I said last service. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> what I love about being one, especially with this man right here, is that I never feel like I'm alone. No matter where I am, I always feel like he's going to be there with me, even though he's not there. I feel like I can call him anytime. And if you've ever been in a meeting with him, you know that sometimes I will call at any time. <laughs> but no matter what, I feel like he's there with me. Even if he's not physically there, he's there with me. Awesome. I, I love that as we interact with each other, we know that uh, where life is found is this oneness that we have. So therefore, we can lose everything. We could lose every dime we have. We still have each other. It means we can build from that place. It's an amazing experience to live knowing that who you are and what you need is in us together. Now, I don't mean it's in her, right? It's not in her and it's not in me. It's in us. Like we are one. And so no matter what happens to the circumstances around us, outside of us, we know we have this oneness. We can start absolutely all over and build from the bottom. And we have. He's yeah, we have a couple times. Yeah. Um, how, this is a little tougher. How would you describe oneness. Why don't you go first? Okay, I'll go first. <laughs> so my experience for oneness, I, I had an advantage in a sense in, in that uh, my wife has arthritis. And so um, that's an everyday thing, right? So anything you get to work on every day, like you you get to really, really practice it. And so for the longest time, uh, I thought I was a great guy, and I was the better guy, better spouse, because I take care of her. So I tie her shoes, I get her dressed, there's all kinds of things that impact. He literally has to get dressed twice a day. Yeah. <laughs> Once for him and then me. That's my excuse for how I dress. And so <laughs> the, one day, it was as if God said, hey, um, you don't have, she doesn't have arthritis. You have arthritis. Together. You're one. It, it really changed everything for me. Like, literally, I, I'm not going to stand before God and God going to go, oh, you were such a good guy. You took care of her. He's, no. That is who I am. Like, that is how we experience life. That whatever she has, I have. Whatever I have, she has. So I don't know how many of you have been in a meeting with Chris and I, but I love to understand what he's thinking. So no matter where we're at, I ask questions. And I ask a lot of questions so I can understand what he's thinking. And, mo and a lot of times people will think that my questions are, how would you say it? Undermining, accusatory, <laughs> uh, but it's not really. It's that I want to understand what he's thinking. And, and so, and I really want to understand it. But I do have a tendency to ask him in kind of unusual ways. But it's because I want to know what he's thinking. I want to be a part of what he's thinking. And I want to really, really understand him. And I want us to be on the same page. And I might go about it a different way, but in the end, we will be on the same page because we are one. And it took me about 25 years <laughs> to figure out that was actually true. 
Like that's actually what was happening. Okay, so uh, talk to us about like um, physical oneness. How does, how does that work? Nah, we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> All right. That picture of oneness, spiritual, emotional, and physical oneness. Now, we're going to jump into this passage. This is our, our main passage for the series, and it's our passage for today. Fairly short, it's this, that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. Now, the first principle is this. Marriage is not a political issue. It's a moral issue. Now, I don't really care where you are politically, but this is really important. Because for the last 15, 20 years, you have heard over and over and over again that marriage is a political issue. It is not a political issue. It is a moral issue. You were created, men as men, and women, you are created as women so that you could experience oneness. So that you could experience coming together as one. God created marriage. The government did not create marriage. Not our government, not the government before our government, not the government before that government or before that government. Human beings did not create marriage. God created marriage. That's the foundation to understanding oneness. It goes on to say, and the two will become one flesh. You're like, okay, I understand that. Um, that's the idea of physical oneness. Um, don't have to, hopefully, don't have to teach you about that. If, you know, if I do, then I can talk to you afterwards if we need to. But that, you, you get that. But he, he's, he goes farther. He goes this, so they are no longer two, but one. They are no longer two, but one. That you, the Bible is crystal, crystal clear. You are no longer two, but one. Now, this is odd. This is an unusual way to think. Ever since you were a very little kid, you've looked at the world through the eyes of this is my life. This is my life. And the reason to get married is to improve my life. The reason that I want to get married is because I want to experience what I experience with this person for the rest of my life. I like this. And so I want to experience more of that. That's, that's odd to be able to go, wait, so I'm not one, I'm two. Yeah, you're no longer one, but, excuse me, <clears throat> therefore you're no longer two, but you're one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. This one's really, really emotionally hard to grab a hold of. Because you remember, you remember fretting over and asking them to marry you. You remember making the decision that you're making this decision. Am I going to marry this person? Do do I want to marry this person for half of you? Do I want to marry this person for the other half of you? Would that person ever want to marry me? Right? Can I have the courage to get to ask that question? You remember being asked the question. If the diamond was big enough, it just wipes out all of this, right? Because you stop thinking. And you're like, yes, I love that diamond, right? So, yeah, so you remember that process. You remember going through that, right? And then you, you remember working your way up to the marriage and all the planning and all that you did, and you think that the marriage was a wedding. You think it was a wedding. Like, big party, nice dress, big people, Huge debt. So you remember all of that. God was there. Why well, don't I even believe in God? It doesn't really matter if you believe in God. He was there. And it says what God has joined together, let no one separate. Now, this next principle coming off of this passage, this next principle is this. There's God's perspective, and then there's my perspective. 
There's what God says is true, and there's what I think is true, or what I've perceived is true, or what I've experienced is true, or what I've come to believe is true based on all of those things gathered together. Now, we live in America where you have been told your voice counts, your opinion matters. You, your opinion, your voice is just as important as anybody else's voice. Now, you got to get this crystal clear. God has given you the freedom to have an opinion and have a voice. He has given you the freedom to have an opinion and have a voice. So you do have a perspective. And God gives his perspective. Here's the deal. Your perspective, when it competes with God's perspective, is wrong. It's dead wrong. God has never been wrong. Now, as we work our way through this, this isn't about whether or not you're right or wrong. This is about whether or not you want to have the marvel of marriage. You're welcome to go on down the road going, I don't care what God says. I'm going to do what I want to do. You will never get to stand in front of a group of people and go, the marvel of my marriage. Because God's perspective is what leads to the marvel of marriage. This principle we're going to work our way through throughout the series. is going to come up time and time again. So uh, have you ever kicked a boulder? Have you ever kicked a boulder? Have you ever been really mad and punched something? You grew up on a farm. We used to get mad from time to time. You'd like punch a tractor, punch a corn picker. It hurts. It really hurts. Guess what? When you get mad, you're like, I'm so mad, and you kick a boulder, right? Your perspective is wrong. Every time you kick that boulder, it hurts. You kick the boulder. This is how crazy we are. You kick the boulder to make yourself feel better. You really do. I'm going to take this out. I'm the boulder. Man, does it hurt. It hurts every time. When you say God has a perspective, but I have my own, you're free to have that. But you're kicking boulders. You're going through life kicking boulders. The opposite of that is riding a wave. How many of you are surfers? Here's a surfer. Awesome one. I'm a surfer. I've been surfing. I've surfed many, many times. I've gotten up three times. So here's here's the thing with with waves. You paddle out in the waves, and you're like, I'm going to take the wave. I'm I'm, I'm strong enough. I can do it. I'm going to beat the wave. That's what I'm going to do. And so the wave comes, and then you're like, paddling like crazy, paddling like crazy, paddling like crazy. The wave goes by. Or the wave comes, you paddle like crazy, paddle like crazy, paddle like crazy, and the wave just... It comes underneath the board and flips you over, right? Because when the first time, like, the, the wave wasn't big enough. The second time, oh, it was big enough. It was too big. It, it beats you. The great surfers, they don't fight the wave. They don't battle with the wave. They get to know the wave. They literally get to know the wave. They sit there and they watch them and they watch them and they watch them and they're like, that's the one. And the old guys, I, I just can't stand these guys. These old guys go, one, two, three, boop, they're up. What's the deal? They rode the wave. They said, yeah, I can have a perspective about the wave. I can have my thoughts about the wave. I can have my experiences with the wave. That doesn't matter. What matters is what the wave is and who the wave is. The wave's perspective is always right. The wave never changes for you. You never watch surfing videos and the wave just goes, oh, I see that guy. Yeah. Let me turn. It never happens. Always you learn to ride the wave. And throughout this series, we're going to use this terminology. Are you kicking the boulder or are you riding the wave? Are you kicking the boulder or are you riding the wave? So, what's the four things we saw from that passage? Here's four things we're going to grab a hold of uh, from from that passage. Number one is this. 
God created you with the ability to experience oneness. God created you with the ability to experience oneness. God created them male, female, so that he would leave his family and unite with her. There's a really good chance in your marriage that you believe because of the person you're married to, you can't experience oneness. That's a lie. It is not true. It may even be that because of you, sins you've committed in the past, habits you've developed in your life, things that you think have become so much a part of you they could, that they could never get, you could never get rid of them. Therefore, you could never, and they're devastating to oneness. They're destroying oneness. You're like, I don't think I could ever, I could ever get there. What's really common is for people to believe, yeah, there's, there's like this level one marriage, and then there's a level two, three, four. Let's just settle, man. Let's just accept. We're all, all we're ever going to have is a level four. Let's just become roommates. Let's get really good at communicating. By the way, if you think the number one problem in your marriage is communicating, no, it's not. It's not. Great, great communicators that only communicate, you know what they do? They become great roommates. They very much understand these are your responsibilities, these are my responsibilities. And you just live together undivorced. And so you think all we can ever have is a four. That's not true. You were created to experience oneness. Second truth, I have to let go of me to be we. I have to let go of me to be we. I can't remember, it was during my lifetime that people started this thing of, don't get lost in your marriage, be your own person, be your own person, be your own person. That's a level 18 marriage. It's terrible advice. It is terrible advice. Oh, I think I got lost in my marriage. No, that's, that's, that's bad advice. You know, did you hear what it said? It said, listen, therefore, he will leave his father and mother. He will leave his identity that comes from his family that he grew up in. She will leave her identity from the family she grew up in. Uh, our church is really blessed. We have a number of what people might call mixed marriages. You come from really different cultures, right? Right? You better let go of that culture. You better. I am first and foremost Dominican. <laughs> you better let go of that culture. <laughs> Some guy just grabbed his heart. He's like, oh, man, no. <laughs> don't do that. See, it's true. You can't become we if you are going to grab a hold of something outside of what God says is true. If you're going to grab a hold of your identity outside of what God says is true. If your parents or your sister or your family that you come from is more important than the person you're married to, you're, you're kicking rocks. You're kicking boulders. And you can go to all the marriage counseling you want. You're just going to keep kicking boulders. It, it, it's, it's beautiful and it grows. Because once you start letting go of that stuff, you find out that oneness is way more beautiful, way more valuable. What an incredible experience compared to, no, we are two different people trying to make it in the same house. Number three, the marvel of marriage is oneness. It is. The marvel of marriage is we are one. I said it earlier, I want to say it again. Because this is absolutely true. I'm not afraid of losing everything, every penny I have. I am not. 
I am not afraid of being a failure in life. Why? All I need is Lori. That's all I need. We're in this together. And we will rebuild from anything that happens together. Oneness is amazing. It is the foundation. It's the central piece of, a, of having a marriage that you marvel at. It's from God. It's his idea. He created it. Which leads us to the next one. If you are married, God has made you one. We need to build unity in our marriage. We need to, we need to do this in our marriage. We need to do this in our marriage. All the while, you're ignoring the fact that God has already made you one. You do not need to become one. This is really important. You do not need to become one. You don't have the power to make yourself one. You need to recognize that God has said what is true and live from there instead of kicking boulders. You need to come to know what God says about oneness, how he describes it, how you experience it, how you practice it, so you can ride the wave. There's wave after, that's one of the really cool things about surfing, which is if you miss this wave, they never stop coming. You just go back, and the guys who are great surfers, that's what they've done. They just keep going back, and they learn more about the wave. They learn more about the wave. They learn more about the wave. God has already made you one. The reason you're not experiencing it is because you're at war with God. You think you're at war with your spouse. You're not. Oneness does not come from first and foremost, the spouse, the husband, and the wife working on becoming one. You become one when you surrender to, wait a minute, God knows what he talked about. God has created it. I'm going to find out what God has. I'm going to figure out how to interact with my spouse like we are one. Why? Because God has already created us as one. It is this simple. When I look at Lori and I see somebody as the problem, when I look at Lori and I see somebody as I need to get her to whatever comes after that sentence, I'm kicking boulders. Versus, wait, time out, time out. She's one with me. If she loses, I lose. Every time she loses, I lose. You tend to feel and naturally think every time we get in these situations, I need to win, I need to win, I need to win. You're at war with God. You're telling God, you don't know what you're talking about. Shh, God, I'm going to go kick boulders. That's what I'm going to do. Versus, no. No. She and I, we're we. We're one. And whatever step I take from this moment, however I handle this problem right now, I'm going to handle it based on the truth that God has already made us one. How do I live like that? How do I live in that? How do I live from that as I move forward? So, this is a uh, graduate level series. So, sometimes I do relationship series and I give you really cool things to do and you go home and go, oh, that was so good. That helped us so much. It was great. And there's all these how-tos that come along. This particular series is a high level series. This is, I'm introducing you to a principle that you do not get to go, oh yeah, I got that. We're one. You're not going to remember this longer than the ride home. <laughs> and the reason for it is because it goes against your natural way of living life. Your natural way of living life is, this is my life. 
And I, I am going to succeed or I am going to fail. You look at everything in the prism of this is who I am. This is my life. I'm going to prove I'm somebody. I'm going to win. I'm going to. Even though you're like, no, no, I'm very sacrificial. I'm very loving and I'm very caring to my spouse. Yes, you are. And you think you're going to get points for it. Yes, you are. And if we could see your heart, your heart is going, whoo, I'm an amazing person. I'm incredible. That's not oneness. It's not. Some of you are really good people, but you're still all alone. You're still kicking boulders. Even though you're doing the things the Bible tells you to towards your spouse, you're not doing it from oneness. This, 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 we're going to work through some tough stuff. Now, um, so that... Uh, you will, one, so you'll come back, and number two, so you'll feel like, I got something out of it. Here we go. Uh, I'm going to give you a few put off, put offs. Like, what, how do we practice this, right? So here's a couple things. Spiritually, how do you practice this? Stop hiding your soul. Stop hiding your soul. Your spouse does not know you. Oh, no, they know what I think. They know, what, yeah, they don't know how you relate to God. They don't know about your battle with God. They don't know about your relationship with God. So, uh, how do you, how, spiritually, how do you do this? Super simple, super simple. Men, this is your job. Uh, you, once a day, take your hands, your wife's hand, and you pray, God, help us practice the oneness you've already given us. That's it. Say those words. That's simple, right? That's easy. Oh, no, it's really hard. It's really hard. This is why it's hard. There are spiritual forces they don't want you to experience oneness. They want you kicking boulders. They know that if you experience oneness, it is the greatest path to your children succeeding for eternity. They know that. They don't want that. So, guys, for some of you, you're like, I, I don't think I can do that. That's embarrassing. Like, that's tough. Just sneak up behind her, look the other way, grab her hand, pray it real quick, God, and then walk away. <laughs> Just get out of there as fast as you can, right? <laughs> get her done, get out. <laughs> Emotionally. Emotionally. There's something we call uh, I see and use. I see and you, you literally, it's an I and a C and an N and a U. But it means this is what I see in you, right? And... You don't have to do this every day. You can do this once or twice, right? Sit down and write out the five things you see in the person that you're married to. Just write those out. This is what I see in you. This is what I see in you. And then say it to them and say, this is we. This is us. I see this in you, but it's us. Whatever strengths you have, that's us. You know what? It doesn't matter if it's a good list or a bad list. Because it's us. This list doesn't have to be, you're the greatest ever. Can't believe how handsome you are. Right? It doesn't have to be that. I would suggest you start there, but it doesn't have to be that. <laughs> Why? Because the principle is, this is us. There aren't two of us. There's one of us. We're together. We're one. How do you know? God said so. That's what God said. So, that's how we interact in emo uh, emotionally. The last one's making love. Now, I'm going to say this a couple times during the series. It'll pop up a couple times during the series. Uh -huh. This, is, this may be, have always been true, but it's wildly true in the culture that we live in. Many, many people have had a lot of sex, but they've never, ever made love. Making love comes from the fruit of spiritual oneness and then emotional, emotional oneness. And out of the spiritual oneness and the emotional oneness comes physical oneness. And 
many of you have sold out to the sex thing. You have sex for yourself. You try to, to, in a zillion different ways, you twist yourself into a pretzel, explaining to the other person how it's for them. But it's not. How do I know? Because when they're not as excited about it as you are, you get mad. That means it's for you. Now, making love from spiritual oneness and emotional oneness is worship. It's amazing. It's incredible. And if you want to know how to do that, you need to come back for the rest of the series. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for oneness. And thank you that life is it's pretty simple. We either trade in our perspective for your perspective. We trade in what we believe is true for what you say is true. We trade in our voice for your voice. Or we kick boulders. And Lord, I want to pray for the men in this room. Those who are married and those who are yet to be married. that they'll be able to look themselves in the mirror and be able to go, wait, 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 wait. Whose perspective are you living from, feeling from, responding from? That they would be able to go, God, I get it. The reason my foot is so sore is because I just keep kicking boulders. Lord, I want to trade in this idea of oneness being all about me and understanding, grabbing a hold of, how do I do this? Live my life. Knowing what's true is I'm no longer, we are no longer true, but we are one. Lord, I want to pray for the ladies who have said to themselves a million times over, this is what I need from him, this is what I need from him. I have to have this. This is what I need from him. I have to have this that they'd be able to step back and go, wait a minute, God has actually already given me that. We are one. God, how do I act like that? How do I live from that? How do I interact that way? Jesus, open our eyes to how wide and deep and long and high is your love. Help us grab a hold of what it means, how to experience it, how to Catch the wave and live, no longer two, but one. In your name we pray, amen.